Hello and welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie. I am the senior editor here and I'm thrilled today to bring you a discussion that aims to demystify contact center AI and perhaps throw up a few more fun rhymes as well. Uh, anyway, joining me for that conversation are two very special guests. Yes, today I'm delighted to be joined by Anders Rue, a senior uh, AI solution architect at Puzzle and Martin Hill Wilson, the founder of Brain Food Consulting. Thanks both very much for joining me and let's get right into the conversation. And I want to start by kind of making a quick observation that many uh, people within the contact center still associate AI mostly with customer facing bots, but there is so much more to AI than that. So it'd be really great to hear from you both some of the other use cases that you're seeing really drive value from within the space. I don't know, Martin, maybe if you want to start on this one. Well, I think the one that's become very, very popular is the summarization um, mm. capability in Gen AI or just drafting letters, emails, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that's been easy to understand the benefit of um, and people have adopted that. It's more than that, though. I mean, if you go right to the beginning of a customer journey, you're looking at triage and routing. And I think the main thing there is that we're moving away from first in, first out logic to something a little bit more sophisticated. So it depends what data you've got available, but you could potentially be drawing anything about preferences or previous interactions uh, from CRM. Uh, you are understanding intent in real time. So again, that gives you some clue combined with sentiment around a triage priority and then ultimately where you want to send them to. So I think that's beginning to sort of take place. And then I'm sure we'll touch on it later. You've got this thing called agent assist, which I think is interesting, which is basically providing the same kind of support to advisors. And I think that's interesting, particularly with, you know, attrition rates about 25%. Um, the speed of onboarding is materially impacted. And generally, actually, Gen AI does seem to work best with least experienced people. You seem to get the, the, the greater benefit. And that happens to play very nicely into that use case. And then in a very sort of broad sense, um, data insight analytics that was previously invisible to us in call centers is now abundant, clear, formatted in dashboards, you know, real time alerts and all the rest of it. So um, that probably is the main stay of those kinds of uh, use cases that people are starting to play with right now. Yeah, it's very comprehensive. So thank you for that, Martin. And what I found really interesting about that personally was that a lot of those use cases actually existed before generative AI. A lot of people seem to think um, that these, this is all new to the market, yet contact centers have been doing this with a natural language processing, like summarization, intent monitoring, and things like that for years. Um, it's just now more accessible and probably more cost effective um, as well. So lots of good stuff there. And obviously, Martin's covered a lot in that uh and is i don't know if there's anything you would add to it though yeah i definitely agree with all all the things that martin said um so like automatic routing is uh like this ai based routing where it's uh, more than just uh, first in first out definitely creates a lot of value and it's often a use case where the uh, like customer might already have some data that can be utilized so you can train on previously routed uh, emails or chats or whatever kind of data you might be using um and also, like Martin mentioned, like agent assist, instead of only thinking about like uh, customer facing or end user facing uh, bot solutions, it's also possible to do agent assist bots uh, either on, on voice or in chat. So like an uh, agent can chat with their um, knowledge base and get uh, help through that. Like Martin mentioned, there's a lot of new agents often in the customer centers. So it's nice to um, be able to onboard new agents quickly. Uh, and that's something we see create a lot of value. Um, and also like the insights into what both uh, agents, if you have like an internal bot, like what are our agents actually asking about? What are the kind of questions that are hard to answer right now where we don't have knowledge available? Uh, and the same goes for end users. So getting these uh, like uh, intelligent uh, insights into what uh, the users are talking about, because you can of course read through a thousand conversations and then you can try to uh, uh, figure out the general theme of those and then figure out what our customers are asking about, but uh, giving a little help uh, for agents and figuring out what the end users are actually talking about and doing clusterings and such uh, also creates a lot of value. Um, and what comes yeah. out of that as the secondary uh, use case? I don't think people are quite there yet, but 
the ability to summarize on knowledge, which we've said, the ability to see what does and doesn't work also lends itself to providing real time coaching. And I think that's one of the really exciting things, because, I mean, it's a little bit of a stereotype, but, you know, quite frankly, if I went to a call center, I'd be trained for six weeks intensively, <laughs> mainly on product, hardly anything to do with soft skills. And then I could be there for another 20 years, receive no training. It's a bit harsh, but it's been very difficult to continue that learning process. Now, the same benefit can get extended to people at the front line, the colleagues looking at, did I do a good job? Did I not do a good job? Is there a gap there? If there is, let me go and auto summarize what is in effect a little bit of micro learning and then gets plugged into the uh, workforce management. And then that can get served up as a discrete little piece of learning and reinforcement that you should be able to do in the next 24 hours, which is ideal because it remains very close to when you know, the incident actually took place. That's still happening, but the technology and the capability is absolutely there. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that because that should make the whole business of development, coaching, support, particularly in hybrid environments, you know, totally different from what we had yesterday. So I think that's the other use case for flagging, which eventually people will sort of get to as well. So we've said about four or five really chunky things. And if you've got all of that up and running, you really would be in a different place. Yeah. And I think what's really exciting about a lot of those use cases like the real time coaching is now that they're embedded within the tools that contact centers are already using um, as well. What well, used to be point solutions. So if you look at puzzle, uh, a platform like puzzle, for example, the automatic QA with sort of those real time coaching is it is already within in the solution. Uh, and then you talk about the reporting benefits, especially with the knowledge base that's already ingrained within like within uh, the solution that's on the platform. So that intuitive embedded approach to AI is making a lot of this exciting and a lot of contact centers might be using AI in ways that, that already that they hadn't necessarily thought uh, thought about. But yeah, lots of good stuff there. And that really does show just how many use cases for AI are within the, in the space. That said, bots, customer facing bots are still very much front of mind. Um, although those that were maybe deployed maybe five or six years ago, didn't always deliver the the outcomes that many contact centers um, had expected. Martin, why why do you think that these bots are now better set than they were maybe five, 10 years ago? So AI is 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 organized and functions through algorithms. And algorithms, although they've been around arguably since we were in call centers years and years ago, you could talk about ACDs, IVRs, had some form of algorithm. They certainly weren't as good then as they are now. And recently, as in 2018, 2019 sort of era, there was a bit of a breakthrough coming out of a number of other associated things, compute power, you know, cloud getting bigger, the ability to feed those algorithms with much, much, much more, much, much more data, <laughs> which gives them a altogether uh, broader capability. And then a, a particular kind of architecture called transformer architecture. And if you put those three things together, natural language today versus natural language then is again, significantly different. So what does that mean in practice? It means, for example, in a conversation, uh, a bot is likely to remember context in a much more useful way than before. So humans, unfortunately, break bots very easily because they won't follow a rule. In other words, this is how we structured a conversation because you'll say, oh, and by the way, can you help me with this before you've even completed the previous thing? Or you'll divert or you'll say it in a particularly uh, localized way to the, your own way of talking. All of that breaks bots. And more often than not, people go, um, that hasn't worked for me. Or the bot will say, I give up. <laughs> Let me give you a human. And so most people's experience actually of bots is hugely frustrated uh, and it hasn't worked as well. So what we're looking at now is a generation of natural language, which is much more capable because it's much closer to actually the way that humans talk. And it's able then to reflect that. So you're likely to get much more to the outcome that people want through that, because it can remember context. Uh, it has also a better language capability. It's, it's if you bother to do it, you can tune it 
to the sentiment of the conversation. You can tune it to the personality of the brand. There's a whole bunch of things you can do. Sitting behind all of that, by the way, I have to say I'm a huge fan of service design as related to conversation, right? So it's one of those conversations that you have to remind yourself that the technology only enables is still got to do the change management. And in the context of this conversation, service design, conversational design is absolutely important. It's why IBR sucked. You know, it wasn't to do with the fact that they were crap, which they were in some respects. It was to do with the fact they were installed by the technology teams. They weren't installed by people who got conversational flow as a precise skill. Yeah. So if you put all that stuff together, bots today really are much better positioned to satisfy user expectations <clears throat> as opposed to frustrate and everyone go, they're rubbish, let's just talk to a human. And I, I do think, especially at the addition of Gen to the AI within that is, is key. So you gave the example there, Martin, of a human won't stick to a rule. Um, and, and that has kind of broken bots before, but now Gen to the AI can monitor that changing intent and say to the customer, well, we're already doing one thing, let's stick to that and then go to some, something else. So, I mean, just simple things like that really can make such a big difference to their performance. Um, and uh, Anders has been uh, very kind for us as well. And he's put together a demo of a next generation uh, bot that's powered by uh, Gen, a, Gen AI. So let's take a quick look at that before we continue our conversation. And it's just a super simple bot to show some of the capabilities of the Puzzle AI bot. Um, the main features being um, how we can use both generative AI to answer FAQs while also providing uh, more static flows. It can uh, show pictures, it could call APIs and can transfer to agents. Um, so if I'll log on over here, then I'm logged on as an agent, then I can open up the widget here. Just write my name. And then this is a demo bot that has uh, indexed uh, knowledge articles on a imaginary streaming platform. So you can ask questions about this uh, streaming platform and the subscriptions and such. So you can write something like, um, uh, what does the uh, different plans cost? And then what happens here is that the search engine, which is really what powers the majority of this chatbot, it looks through it, the index knowledge and it tries to find relevant knowledge article. It found this one on plans and pricing, and then it uh, synthesized an answer using generative AI to present an exact uh, answer to the question that the user posed. You can also ask follow-up questions like, um, what is included in the basic? And then again, it has access to the conversation that the user has had with the chatbot combined with knowledge articles and then uses generative AI to present a precise answer to the question that the user posed. Mm. And I'll dive a bit deeper into the search engine in the next part, but I really want to emphasize that this is not, these are not answers that I've manually created. This is just a combination of the already existing knowledge in the knowledge base a search engine and generative AI. Um, then I've also made like a, a more standard flow to show off how that can be combined. So you can ask like, uh, what can you do? And something like this. And then what happens here is that I've created a AI model that recognizes uh, this question, similar questions, uh, and it then goes into a flow. So this is actually one of these hybrid bots where there's both a combination of generative AI and search engine and more standard flows. So this is a manual answer that I've created. You can, for example, send images, you can send buttons, do all sorts of things. You could also uh, call an API if you wanted to and perform some kind of action, maybe reset a password, look up information in a CRM system, anything like that. And this could then in turn be fed into generative AI if you wanted to, but you could also provide more static flows where you actually know what's happening. And we see that this is where the hybrid bot creates a lot of value, that it uh, gives the best of both worlds. You both get control uh, and integrations and flows, but you also get the capabilities of generative AI and uh, search engines. Um, here you can be transferred to so right and like, yes. 
and it's been transferred. See the chat is open here. I can agent can look through the entire conversation. You would also be able to, if you wanted to, to add a AI summary over here, so the agent doesn't have to read through the entire conversation, and then the agent can chat with the user, and the user can chat with the agent. Um, this is the basics of how a chatbot work with a puzzle. Excellent. So that was the uh, demo. Thanks very much for preparing that uh, as well, Anders. Um, what that nicely leads us on to, though, I think, is kind of what differentiates the puzzle bot from others maybe on the market as, as the conversational AI space is incredibly crowded um, at the moment. So yeah, what, what does differentiate it? Yeah, yeah. so, so some of this also ties into what Martin said uh, previously about like uh, older generations versus newer generations. Um, so in the older generations of bots that people might have been used to had to uh, do a lot of uh, manual labor or like maintenance for the bot to function well. So we have had customers for a while, like five, six years back, who've built very good bots, but some of these bots have required a lot of maintenance. But if you put in the effort, then you can make something that's well-functioning that actually solves a lot of people's uh, inquiries. But what we've uh, seen in more recent years, it is more easy to uh, make a well-performing bot. Uh, and I think that's one of the uh, main capabilities of the, the Puzzle AI bot is to uh, make it easy to deploy uh, a bot that sort of has the best of both worlds. So it both have uh, like generative AI capabilities, which is very good at answering FAQs and such. Um, but you can also build more uh, structured flows that are good for performing actions or making sure that you uh, extract specific information from a user before you transfer to an agent or fill out a form or send a video or whatever you might want to do. Call an API that resets a password, stuff like this. Uh, I think is a bit uh, more well handled uh, in these uh, structured flows versus generative AI, although you can also do some of it uh, through generative AI. Um, so I think making it uh, easy to um, construct such a, a like a high performing bot uh, with minimal maintenance is one of the key features. Uh, and then also having control on the generative AI is also one of the things that we bring to the table. So it's very easy to just get going with a uh, generative AI API and then uh, pop that out in your web page. But then I think most people have seen these cases where somebody tries to break the bot and it goes off the rails and starts talking about politics or whatever, something it shouldn't talk about. Uh, and we really want to make it easy to control the generative AI. So it's also one of the things that we that we bring, that it's not, um, <clears throat> not uh, like this pure generative AI that can talk about everything, it can talk about your domain and it can answer the questions based on uh, factual documents that you uh, make available uh, to the bot. Um, and yeah, I think then the last thing is that it's very easy to build. So it's not it's not a data science project. You don't have to have a PhD in uh, NLP to get going. It's really a, a business project uh, where we need the domain people. Like Martin also said previously, that we don't want the uh, IT department to be responsible for the bot unless it's actually a bot that talks about IT specific questions, then they're probably the right ones to build it. But in general, we want to anchor the um, bot building and maintenance at the business unit who actually knows the domain and knows how the customer speaks uh, and how it should answer. So I think that's like three different components where I see that we are different than some of the other vendors on the market. Yeah, I think lots of really good stuff um, there, Anders, uh, too. And you mentioned uh, some of the stories that we've seen of, of bots misbehaving, that DPD incident really uh, stands out, I guess, where it saw a, cu a customer, New York City's bot telling small business owners to break the law. Um, and I think Air Canada's bot got sued or something. Um, but yet yeah, that kind of really does does uh, showcase the value of working with a trusted partner like like Puzzle uh, as, business, uh, as businesses uh, start their AI journey. But it does also raise the point of AI readiness um, and our contact centers prepared um, really to take on some of these AI um, projects. So I don't know, Marcel, I'll, I'll start with you on this, but I want to kind of get both of your uh, opinions. Where do you think contact centers uh, should start uh, on their AI journeys? Well, I also, I, I, I'm a big fan, as people probably know, of strategy because I do think it's good to have a map and decide where you want to go before you start walking somewhere. 
because if you walk in the wrong direction, you're going to go a long way around the block. So I, I think that this is particularly uh, an interesting development in the space because it's had a huge amount of press. Um, it's had a lot of internal knee-jerk reaction from very, very senior people, and a lot of people have been told to get on with it. And as, as, as a result of that, that's all the things that will get you to fail, because you're doing it without context, without meaning, without understanding, without really business benefit. So I think that some of the fundamentals that we all know about if we actually sit down and sober up are good to do. So, so, so the first thing I would say is, and I think this conversation has illustrated it, it's not just about a, a bot. It's actually about a core capability that drives service journeys from the beginning to the end for both customer and also, um, you know, frontline teams, for team leaders, for analysts, for, you know, for site managers, for senior people. It changes the game. So what does that look like? And I think that's a question that is really worth asking. But you ask that also in relationship to where you're currently stuck and frustrated in terms of your own capability and the effort they have to put in to just get through the day. So that then takes you to a place of, of, of saying the future really could and should look quite different. Um, what could it look like? Uh, and already we've given some hints, I think, in this conversation that life has got considerably easier when AI can do some of that heavy lifting. So think about that, because there's lots of good reasons. I mean, we've got, for example, on the advisor side of life, um, a much reduced workforce in terms of availability to recruit. We've still got a workforce that doesn't stick around as long as it might do and is frustrated with the pressures of that. And we've still got the hangover from COVID in terms of management of, of workforce. Um, we've got customers that have changed. We've got customers that actually seem to want to communicate more rather than less. Voices back in vogue where we thought it was going to about to disappear. Um, you know, it's a complex world uh, in terms of the demands that there are sitting there. And there is, generally speaking, less budget. So we have to somehow square all those circles and make it work. Uh, so therefore, what does AI really do for us? And if you think about any major change, it's not going to happen in three months. You know, I can remember Omnichannel has been a three to five year journey and still you could argue that very few have done that well. So AI itself will take some time. So it all begs the question of saying, do you really know what a North Star looks like? Do you really know where you're going? Do you really know what the vision of that would look like? And have you got everybody lined up internally? Are you clear what it's going to take? Are you going to clear what you're going to have to change as a result of that? And then where do you want to start? And then you've got questions around of AI, unsurprisingly, is data hungry. And, you know, we know that of the large language models. It's also true internally. If you've got rubbish knowledge management, it will spit out rubbish knowledge management. <laughs> it, it won't solve that problem for you directly. So there's a lot of enablement that you've got to do in terms of readiness. Um, you've probably still got people freaked out by the headlines about it's going to take my job. That still needs to be a conversation that actually we are using it to supplement rather than to get rid of. Although year on year, you're still going to find people making big dramatic headlines saying, I've got rid of 30% of my workforce. So it's going to continue to freak people out. So it needs a proper plan, a proper vision to get all of that stuff done, because at the end of the day, you will get there quicker by spending some time thinking about it rather than just rushing at it. So that's a long answer to the question, Charlie. But, you know, AI readiness, I think, is probably the next major milestone for most people, having run at it, got excited, and discovered that it's not actually going to be as easy as it sounds. Mm. Yeah, it's very comprehensive answer there, Martin, but really excellent uh, stuff there. And you've given Anders a difficult job to follow that up. Uh, but I don't know if there's anything that you'd maybe uh, add to that, Anders. Yeah, definitely. And I agree with Martin, like what he said, like having a strategy and having somewhere to go instead of just uh, walking in a random direction. But yeah, and I want to add, I think it's it's very important to start in one place as well, like, because sometimes we have customers who want to do uh, chatbot, voice bot, email bot, and uh, internal bot all at the same time. And I think the chances of all of that happening and then doing that within six months is uh, are quite low. Also, like with uh, like having an organization that needs to uh, um, actually use the tools and gain value from it. 
Um, so I think like starting in, in one place uh, and then getting some experience uh, doing that and then expanding to a new place, like starting with a chatbot and then once that works, maybe do an email bot, maybe do a, a voice bot uh, or do both if you have a lot of, uh, if you really want to get going, but I think it's good to get some experience doing one thing before you try to uh, build everything at once. Um, and then like in terms of having the knowledge uh, ready, I really see that's important as well. So for example, if you want to build like a, this kind of uh, like generative AI FAQ uh, rack, uh, but where you need to base it on some factual knowledge, then having some knowledge in place is very important um, because otherwise the answers that will come out will be uh, very bad and not specific to your knowledge. Um, but you can also do like a hybrid where you don't have all the, all the answers at once, then you just need to know when can we answer, when can we not. Like, we don't want it hallucinated, but it's okay that it says, I can't answer that. And then once you get some of the examples where I can't answer, then you can do, for example, like a clustering of those answers, and you can see what are the common topics here, then we can add that to the knowledge base. So it can also be like a feedback loop where you have, uh, like, you can, you're able to answer 50% of the uh, inquiries as long as you don't come up with uh, horrible answers for the last 50%, then that's actually a, a decent place to start. So, yeah, so I think it's also possible to get going without having everything in place, but it's yeah. definitely nice to start one place and uh, getting some experience and then moving on from there. I think the Excellent. other thing yeah, that goes with it is that oh, automation makes you think that you can just switch it on and walk away. And that's one of the biggest mistakes you can possibly make. So knowledge management, for example, again, if we go back 10, 15, 20 years, we've had knowledge management forever, but it's proven to be more difficult to do than everybody thought. And what you have is knowledge bases that go out of, you know, they just go out of value because nobody's maintaining and curating them. Um, and the same with a bot, for example, you will have some intents that really are nailed and they're fantastic, but customers don't think of those terms. They're going to ask anything, particularly if a bot seems to work, they're not going to get discipline. So what you really do need is a sort of agile, well-resourced team sitting behind all of these transformations, watching how the automation actually does the job that it's meant to do and expanding it, optimizing it, making it better, joining it up with something else. So unless you've got that in place and probably doing it in an agile, disciplined way as well, um, it's not going to take off. So that's the other point to be made. You've got to have a business as usual team, but also a constantly sort of transformationally orientated team to continue taking you up the hill to get the level of, of, of transformation and the ROI that you've been sold in the first instance. Hmm. I do also think it's in, interesting, though, how AI is being used to improve the data itself as well and how they, there are use cases for that. So, for example, there's the use case of a knowledge management um, yeah. in knowledge management of scanning um, topics that aren't already in the knowledge yeah. base yeah. Um, and then kind of suggesting knowledge articles for review and then putting those to an experienced agent or, or uh, leader to review. And I think those sort of use cases of AI improving the data, which then improves the AI, uh, is, a, is a particularly interesting uh, field to watch. But I'm sure we could have this conversation for another half an hour uh, and still come up with lots to talk about at the end. But it's been a really fascinating chat and both of you have been great. So thanks very much um, to Martin and Anders for joining me and also to everybody for watching. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.